Good morning, Bayside. Would you stand up this morning? It's going to be hot this week, so enjoy today and tomorrow. Tomorrow's supposed to be like a high of 84, and then it gets crazy for a couple days. So, uh, My family and I, we were at Sacramento County Fair. Did anyone go to the county fair this last week? Awesome. Like four of you. Cool. Uh, we sold some pigs. We had a good time, and we missed you guys. So, But we're back now, and uh, let's worship together. Get those hands together. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good. He is above all things. His love someone and welcome them to church this morning. Introduce yourself if you don't know their name. Good morning, Bayside. This is awesome. This is like summertime party in church, right? Thank you for being here this morning. We're glad you're here to worship with us. We have one reason for being here, and that's to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're glad that you're here to share it with us. We've got a great day, great morning planned for you, a couple of, couple of unique things going on. But before we get there, if you're new with us, if you have never filled out a contact card, if you'd like to get a little bit more information about our church, there's a contact card in the chair in front of you. If you just fill that out for us. Put it in the offering bucket as it goes by, and I would love to tell you about what God is doing in our church and a little bit more about who we are. If you're interested, do that. There's also a place on there for prayer, prayer requests. We love to pray for our people. It's one of our, our most important ministries, 
And if you have a prayer request, something that you would like for us to be praying about, put that on the contact card. Put it in the offering bucket as it goes by, and we will get you on the prayer chain. We have about 20 people, and, and we have more than that praying, but it's all I can fit on my, on my text message. It, that's, that's the limit. So uh, we'll, we'll be praying for you, whatever that is. And also, as we always do at the end of the service, we have our prayer team up here, and we would love to pray for you then as well. Also a place on there to sign up for ministry. If you're interested in serving somewhere in our church, you can just check that box, and we'll get the person responsible for that area of ministry to get back in touch with you and give you a little bit more information. We got some things going on. Yes, we do. Tonight, guys, we are continuing in our series in what it means to be a man of God. In our culture, in a time when masculinity is something that's shot down and that's made fun of and has is, is diminished and ridiculed, we are digging into what it means to truly be a man of God. We've had a great series so far, about 17, 18 guys. We'd love to have you join us. If you haven't before, not too late. They're, each one stands alone. And we have a potluck, we eat together, we share together, and boy, do we eat. Man, you guys that are coming and bringing stuff to eat, it's amazing. And then, not to be outdone, ladies, on Tuesday night, your series is continuing. So come on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Guys, tonight is 5 o'clock. Tuesday night, ladies, is 6 o'clock. Potluck, come and share in what's going on in that series with the ladies as well. Great time for you to just get together and, and just connect and share and dig into God's word. It's a great time. So then we've got coming up uh, next Sunday, or not next Sunday, I'm sorry, two weeks from today, we are doing a baptism. Great time in our family to baptize people. We'd love to do that. If you're interested, if you've never been baptized and have asked Jesus into your heart, the next step in the logical step of, of uh, obedience to Christ is to be baptized. And if you're interested in that and would like more information about it, please come talk to me after the service, any one of our staff, our leadership team, and uh, we would love to give you a little bit more information about that and sign you up and tell you a little bit more about the logistics and how it works. So that's two weeks from today, a baptism. It'll be during the service, at the end of the service, as we always do. It's fireworks booth time. Yes, it is. <laughs> Any That's because they're any, not working any, in the booth. Any of you right? kids like fireworks? <laughs> None of them work in the booth, but hey, it's fireworks, right? It's all good. So Fourth of July is coming up. But we actually have a Bayside and Galt fireworks booth. It's up right across the street from Walmart. Every year, we, we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood vicinity, give or take, of about $30,000 that we make profit from this booth that we can put into our... It's a separate fund that we use for... for whatever, and we, we, we always seem to have a need. We've put in a new air conditioning unit. We've put in siding and done some things for improvement in our facility. We've helped to use it to subsidize kids for camp and a number of different things, but it's just set aside for things that we need extra that are outside our budget. We need help. We need help for signing up to man the booth. It's not hard. I can do it. They let me do it, and if they let me do it, anybody can do it, okay? So it's just a matter of being there and, and, and making the sales. It's all done by computer, and it's all pretty much uh, a no-brainer, uh, which is good for me. So if you would like to do that, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table. It's got time slots when you're available. I believe they're four-hour increments. And as the time gets closer to 4th of July, it gets busier and busier and busier. So we need your help on that if you would participate. Now, here's a really cool unique opportunity. In your bulletin, there's a little flyer, and it says you're invited. And if you're interested in this, talk to Denise Lane. Denise, where are you? She's back there in the, with the red shirt and with her hand up, Denise or Dan, and, uh, or Frank and Susan back there in the back row. Frank, go ahead, raise your hand. We know, okay, there he is. All right, so if you want to go and preview the fireworks, if you want a private fireworks showing from Phantom Fireworks, this is an opportunity for you to do it. Check out the flyer. It's awesome. You can bring a chair, like a beach chair, a lounge chair, lawn chair, and some dinner maybe, and you get to preview the fireworks before we even sell them. How cool is that? So if you're interested, uh, more information, the, the flyer is in your bulletin. And finally, it's time for Breakaway. It's time for Breakaway. Three weeks from tomorrow, I believe it's three weeks or four weeks from tomorrow? 
It, uh, three, that's what I thought. Three weeks from tomorrow, we start our Breakaway Kids Camp. It is going to be awesome. We're already seeing, starting to see some decor pop up around the facility. Last week, you know, we had a couple of our, of our cadets that came in and, and reported for duty. It was a little early yet, so we sent them packing, told them to come back. But if you are interested, so student-wise, as far as kids, get signed up. We want to know, we need to pre-register, we have a cap of 200 kids. Not sure where we're at with that. Kelly, where's Kelly? How many? 130. We're at 130, so there's still room. Okay, so if you have kids that want to be, be part of that, get them signed up. Also, if you want to volunteer, now I understand that our student volunteers, which is like junior high and high school, is full. We, we don't need any more student volunteers, and that is amazing. Adult volunteers, we could still use some help in some different areas. So did we get that put in where we can, they can sign up online? So the website is on the, on the, in the bulletin. Go on there and you can volunteer. You can sign up to help us volunteer as an adult. Even if you don't like kids, there's other areas you can serve in. Food ministry, food prep and security and uh, med medical uh, emergency type stuff, whatever. We'll find a place for you, but we'd love to have you serve. So. With all that said, that's all the announcements. However, today is a very special Sunday. Today is the Sunday that all of those young kids, all those kids or older kids who are going into a new area of ministry, of student ministry, this is your promotion Sunday. Today is the day that you will go, if you're, from, if you're in kindergarten going into first grade, you will now go into the big kids' room Woohoo! Gotta like that, right? If you are in sixth grade going into seventh grade, you will now go into the youth, the student room. Woohoo! Right? All one of you. That's great. If you are, did we have any if there are any middle schoolers going into high school? Right Drew, right on, buddy. Yeah, another one over here. All right, congratulations. You made it this far. Do we have any, I'm not aware, but do we have any students who have graduated from high school this year? Any? We're working on that, on, okay? We, we got, graduating. Who? Yeah. Okay, right back here. Not, congratulations. That's awesome. You know what? She needs special recognition. Graduating from high school. Glad to hear it. Anybody graduating from college? That's a little stretch, okay? A master's? How about a PhD? Anything? A doctorate? Okay, we're all good. So today is the day, but I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our student and, and children's ministry leaders, Elaine and Jen. Bethany's not here. She's our children's director, but Jen, or Jen, would you stand up? And Elaine, would you stand up, please, so we can... That's their favorite thing to do. I think Jen's in the nursery. Jen's in the Jen's nursery. Jen's in the nursery. Okay, so... I may go without dinner tonight, but that's okay because it's the men's potluck, so I'll still get to eat. It's all good. So um, student ministry, I'd have you stand up, but they're already standing up. Nate's in the cage. Kelly's up here behind the microphone. Awesome. Now, if you have ever and are or, and or are volunteering in kids' ministry in any capacity, stand up. Stand up. Come on. Don't be shy. That is awesome. Thank you for what you do. So we would just like to pray over our kids and our kids' ministry, especially this morning, which we're constantly in prayer for them. But man, our kids' ministry rocks it. And this is the future of the church, and we are so proud of them, and we're so proud of our staff and what God's doing in them and through them. So would you pray with me? And as we pray, we'll go ahead and have our ushers come on forward this morning. Father God, what a privilege to stand here with these young people and celebrate their achievement of moving up from one grade to the other. Father, we ask a special blessing on their lives. We ask for a special sense of direction for them. And we ask for a special sense of direction for their parents and the families that are bringing them up to love you. Father God, we just commit them into your hands that you would make their path clear, that you would keep them close to you, that you would just challenge them in the direction that you would have them to go, even at that young age. And we lift up our, our volunteers and our youth and children's staff to you, that you will just bless them, Father, for their, 
for their ministry. Bless them for serving and for the impact that they're having on these kids' lives. It's immeasurable and it's eternal, and we thank you. We thank you for that and for them. We thank you for what you're doing here in us and through us this morning and ask that you would continue to bless us as we worship you. In your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Would you stand this morning as we continue to worship? This next song talks about God being a way maker, God being a miracle worker, a promise keeper and a light in the darkness. It also talks about in the bridge that even when I don't see it, you're still working. And I don't know about when you're going through something tough, if maybe you're going through something right now, but it's pretty tough to recognize God's hand in your life when you're really struggling and, and, and deep down in a pit, but God is still working in your life. Let's sing this together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are, you are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every heart i worship you i worship you you are here healing every heart i worship I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. Amen. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you My God, that is who you are. 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 That. 
That is who you are. 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 just continue in our worship this morning through communion. As most of you know, every month, first, first Sunday of the month, we get to have the privilege of serving communion together and just sharing uh, together as we celebrate what Jesus did on the cross from us, for us. I'd just like to read a passage from Psalm 63 this morning that says, You are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands and worship you. I will be fully satisfied. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. We're celebrating the richness of Christ. We're celebrating the richness of his love. We're celebrating everything that he's done for us, everything that he's going to do for us. And this is a time where, you know, I don't know about you, but oftentimes it just seems like you you just get dried up. It's just like, God, where are you? You know, God, just speak to me. Refresh me. Like the scripture said, we're like a, a, a parched land and we're just crying out for Christ and we're crying out to God for his grace and his mercy and to and to just refresh us and this is a time this morning when we can do that and maybe this is the only time maybe you haven't had an opportunity to do this since last month when we had communion I hope that's not the case but for many of us I'm sure that you know, we get so busy with life and we just get so busy with distractions and things that are going on and now's another opportunity to do that so as we share this morning in communion there are going to be four. There are four stations in the corners of the of the facility. Take a piece of bread, and, and take the cup, and return back to your seat when you're ready. I really encourage you to take a moment and just reflect. Just reflect on what Christ has done for you. Allow God. Just give the Holy Spirit a chance, an opportunity in the quietness of this moment to speak into your heart, to allow Him to to refresh you, to allow Him to quench that thirst that we have, that we were created to have that desire for him. When you're ready, take, go back and, and, or to the front, take a piece of bread, the cup, return to your seat, and just remain in an attitude of worship. Let, let God speak into your heart in that moment. And the reason we do this is because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the last night that he spent with his disciples, he was sitting around the table with them, what we know as the Last Supper, and he took the, the loaf of bread and he broke it. And he passed it around to his disciples and he said, take and eat this bread as a symbol of my body that is going to be broken for you. And he blessed the bread and passed it around. And then he took the cup and he blessed the cup. He asked a blessing on the cup and they passed that around to each of the disciples. And he said, drink this in remembrance of me. Drink this as a symbol. This is, this is the, the blood offering that is being poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And then Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross and we know that his body was broken and we know that his blood was shed for us but the best part of it is, is he conquered death. He rose again three days later. He lives today. He lives in our hearts. We serve him. We serve a risen Savior and he just wants our hearts. We don't have anything that we can give him back but ourselves. And that's what we want to do this morning. Sacrificially, just give ourselves back to God and let him speak into our hearts. So I'm going to, to pray a blessing on the bread. And I'm going to pray a blessing on the cup. And then when you're ready, and I really encourage you as families, if you want to just get back in a corner someplace and, and hold hands and huddle up as a family and pray together and take communion together as a couple, as a husband and wife, do that in the quietness of your seats. That's fine. Whatever your expression of worship is, we encourage that this morning, but just allow God the time to speak into your hearts. Paul, in Corinthians, later gave instructions to the church that this is what we are to do. 
This is in obedience to Christ. This is in obedience to what, to what he told us to do and the example that he gave us and the fact that he shed his blood on the cross for our sins. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we just thank you for the privilege of coming before you, acknowledging, worshiping, celebrating what you did for us on the cross. We thank you that this is a time of redemption. It's a time for us to look within ourselves that we can be forgiven. We thank you that for your forgiveness that you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's for every one of us, regardless of our past. It's a time of rejoicing. It's a time of remembering what you did for us. Father God, this morning as we sit here and as we stand and as we worship you, I pray that you would speak into our hearts in a powerful way that we will know when we leave this place today that we've been touched by the hand of Almighty God himself the living God, our Savior, our Redeemer. We thank you and we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen.
this past week, uh, I'm working in the Bay Area now, and probably for a minute, a couple, a couple four or five months. And um, so I get to go over or around the Altamont, and so I've got a little bit of extra time on my hands, which is really a blessing, um, maybe. But anyways, and I just had some time to think and to thank God for what he's doing in my life and in our church, and that's exciting. Um, I didn't get to go last week to the men's group, but the week before, it was so encouraging just seeing men just talking about God um, and, and growing in their faith. And, uh, and I've been seeing it in our church, just families coming and people just just seeking out God. And, and maybe some of you are sitting here just going, I don't know what I'm doing here this morning, but God's got you here right now. God loves you. Um, he died on a cross for you and, and he wants you in his life. And so this morning, as we just continue our worship, you're here for a reason. You're not here by mistake, let me tell you that. God has got you right here, right now. And he wants you to be in his hand. So we're gonna continue to sing this morning. I don't know about you, but um, we've gotta trust in something, right? And so as, um, as I've been in my work career, different things have been going on, and sometimes we change jobs and different stuff, but I have to continue just to trust that God's got me, um, that God is gonna take care of me, that God is gonna continue to provide. And, um, and so that's been my prayer this week as I'm driving, is just saying, God, just continue um, to direct me in my life. And that's my prayer for you this morning. Let's sing this together. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine My fourth man in the fire, time after time, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission and all that's at rest. I know the author of tomorrow is ordered by step. So this is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. I sought the Lord, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard. And he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust that's why I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior. Who will never fail? He will never fail. Amen. 
We'll just close out our, our set this morning. I'm going to give my fingers one minute just to come back to life. Um, but this next song just talks about um, giving, God, give me faith. And it talks about I need you to soften my heart and break um, me apart. And I know sometimes we come into church with um, past experiences, um, past hurts, and different things that we bring into the building. And our hearts are hard. Um, our lives have become hard, and we're not open to what God is doing in our lives. And, and this song just talks about that, God, I need you, but you're going to have to soften. You're going to have to break some of those areas that, are, that I've just put a wall up against. Um, if, if you're going to invade my life and my heart, I'm going to need you to do that. Um, I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life, that, God, you are doing something amazing in my life. Let's sing this together. thank you so much for this morning. And God, I pray that you would give us that faith, that faith to trust you, that faith 
that blind faith that God, we don't know the answers, but for some reason we're sitting at Bayside Church in Galt right now because God, you brought us here. You want to teach us something, you want to show us something. And God, maybe it's just to remind us how much you love us, that we are a child of you, a son of the king, a daughter of a king. And God, I just pray this morning you continue to pour into our lives. God, that we would use this church and the community here, God, to lean on one another. God, to grow stronger together as a family. And so God, just speak to us from your word today. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you may be dismissed and youth. There goes half the congregation. Yeah, I love it. So I don't know if you knew this or not, but the first Sunday of every month, our students actually volunteer to help out in kids' ministry. I think that's pretty cool, too. It's kind of like they're, they're volunteer to service, which is, which is awesome. And by the way, our kids' ministry can always use more help. Once a month, whatever you could do, it's, it's I don't want to say crowd control, but it's just helping out. You don't have to teach. Uh, you don't have to, you know, have a big in-depth knowledge of the Bible. Just, just to be there and, and just to be a presence, a presence in the kids' lives is awesome. So anyway, think about that, pray about it, see what God wants you to do. So there was a guy back in the mid-1800s that probably most of you, well, I would say probably all of you have heard of. His name was Henry Ford. And what he is most known for, now, now I know some of you guys are, are car buffs, and I, I, in fact, we have a, a person here this morning who actually won stock car, Clarence, is that what you, is that what you drive? He won his race last night, which is awesome. So anyway, nice job. But those of you who, you, you probably know a whole lot more about this than I do, but Henry Ford, a lot of people think he invented the automobile. He did not invent the automobile. What he invented was the mass-produced automobile, which made it possible for us today, if you drive a car somewhere, it's been influenced by Henry Ford. And he had a whole lot of inventions. He had a whole lot of things that he had his hand in. It wasn't just in automobiles and steam engines and gasoline engines. And he actually built an airplane. Probably most of you didn't know that about Henry Ford. But there were 161 unique patents in his name. 161 things that he invented, designed, and got a patent on. And in spite of his success as an inventor and an entrepreneur and, and a businessman, he had a lot of failures along the way. A lot of failures along the way. Just a couple. of His first attempt at, in, at incorporating his company was struck down in court because he was not a licensed manufacturer. Ford was convinced by President Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, to run for Senate, and he was soundly defeated. He founded Ford Airline Company. Y'all flew on Ford Airline Company lately, right? It failed miserably. Nobody wanted to buy into his airline or fly in his airline. He attempted to build a city in the middle of the Amazon jungle. It failed. Surprise, surprise. But in all of this, in all of, in all of these, oh, and here's an interesting one. He tried to establish the first moving assembly line for putting cars together. Somebody stole his idea and his design, and his last name was Olds. Oldsmobile took his design and was the first to put an assembly line. A lot of failures along the line, but listen to what, what Henry Ford said about his failures. He said, a mistake is an opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Hmm. A little thought producing there. And then he said, don't find fault, find a remedy. Wow, if we could take that little nugget and apply it to our lives, what a difference that would make. And the last one, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do, but on what you do. Interesting. What the Israelites were learning as we study, as we continue in our study in Joshua, is they're learning these lessons the, far, the hard way. What they're learning is, is that every failure isn't forever. And these principles that we look at from, from the book of Joshua are so applicable today that the, that the Old Testament, I want to just remind you and encourage you that you, know, you think the Old Testament is ancient history, but the application on the principles of what God teaches us in the Old Testament are so huge for us today that it can be life-changing. 
and hopefully it will be life-changing as we continue in this series. Every failure isn't forever. The Israelites are learning this the hard way. First through the first six chapters, everything's going great. Then the seventh chapter that we looked at last week, it turned bad. But somebody sinned in the, in the house of, of Israel, in the nation of Israel, took some things that didn't belong to him, from things that God had forbid them to take, and they were, the next time they went out in battle to take on the city of Ai, which was a little city just north and east of Jericho, they were soundly defeated. A couple things we noted from last week. First is this, is Joshua did not seek the Lord's guidance before they went out in that battle, which he has done every time up until this point. Every time God has instructed Joshua to do something, Joshua has turned to God and said, what is it that we're going to do here? What do you want me to do? And God has directed them, and God did some, some pretty amazing things. This one time he did not do that, and they were defeated. Now, it wasn't just because he didn't seek God out, but it was, it was because they didn't obey God as the nation of Israel. You see, every failure isn't forever. Don't be defined by past failures. And this is the lesson that we want to take out of this this morning. And I know time's a little short, but we still want to dig into God's word and see what he has to speak to us this morning. Don't be defined by past failures. Let God define your future for you. You see, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter. It's water under the bridge. And yeah, you may still be experiencing some of the consequences of past experiences or past decisions that you've made or consequences of things that have gone on in your prior life that are still affecting you today, but they don't have to define your future. You see, God can define your future for you, and he wants to define your future for you. He has already defined your future for you. It's just a matter of us, like Joshua, seeking him first and seeking with their sense of direction, seeking the direction that he wants you to go. You see, when Joshua neglected to seek God's guidance for the future, it became his plan. It was a little bit of arrogancy, perhaps, on his part. Maybe not necessarily that Josh said, well, I'm going to do it my way, but just neglecting God's plan, just neglecting to seek God and just neglecting to find out God's direction for him was a little bit of arrogance and complacency on his part. And do we not all, at some time or another in our lives, maybe more often than not, suffer from the disease of complacency? Or we just get so comfortable that it's almost like we don't need God. And we won't come right out and say that, but the way we live our lives and the way we neglect God, we're basically saying that, aren't we? That I don't need God. This is all great. I can do this on my own. And because of that decision, 36 men were killed and their, fa and their families were without a husband. Their families were without a father. And the results were catastrophic for the nation of Israel. See, if Joshua had just asked God, what is it that you want me to do for the, before we go into this next battle, God would have revealed to Joshua at that point that there was sin in the camp, that Achan, whose name was Trouble, we looked at that last week, had taken some things that didn't belong to him that God had forbidden, and because of that, the nation of Israel was defeated in their battle, and if, jo if Joshua had just talked to God, just asked him, what do you want us to do in this next battle, God probably would have revealed, and I don't pretend to know the mind of God, but I, I really think that God would have told Joshua at that point, don't go, don't you go into that battle because there's sin in your camp and you are not going to win this battle until you take care of it. Joshua could have dealt with the problem at that point in time and saved them a whole lot of heartache and a whole lot of headache. And isn't that true for us? If we had just contemplated and if we had just asked God for direction and for his guidance and something that was coming up in the future, some decision that we needed to make, some sense of direction of where he wanted to go would have saved us a whole lot of heartache and headache going down a direction and a road that we never intended to go or we did intend to go and turned out that it wasn't the very good direction to go. I, I've experienced that in my life and we can go on and on about that, but if you want to hear some of my stories, that's, that's a different different message for a different time. But last week we made this statement, and I want to reiterate it one more time because it's so important that we learn this, that God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. That was a quote by Jim Elliott, a missionary pilot who was martyred for his belief in Christ. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. Now, I don't know about you. I want God's best for my life. 
And I think you do too. Sometimes we just don't admit it or sometimes we just don't live that way. And because of comfortableness, complacency, we don't live that way. We don't seek his guidance. Well, Joshua, after he's already been defeated, he finally decides, gee, maybe I better talk to God about this and find out what's going on because I don't think he brought us into the promised land to be defeated. And in Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 9, we see this prayer where Joshua gets on his knees and he finally prays to God. But listen to this prayer. Now, I know this is kind of like water under the bridge. We, last week, we saw how the Israelites had been defeated. But now Joshua decides, maybe I should pray about this. And he says, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their, ha- on their heads. Now, that was a, a sign of deep mourning. It was a sign of deep sorrow. It was a sign of, of deep coming before God and, and admitting that they had screwed up. Heartfelt, deep sorrow. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, Why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your great name? Really, John? I mean, can you hear... The, the tone of this prayer from Joshua, he said, wouldn't it have been better if we had stayed in Egypt? Now, this is starting to sound very familiar to the children of Israel who, when they came to the Red Sea and the Pharaoh's army was chasing them and the water was before them and the army was behind them, they said, what are you going to do? Help us. Wouldn't it be better if we'd stayed in Egypt? We're all going to be wiped out. No, God had a better plan. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. And Joshua gets on his knees, but listen to this prayer. And and let me just say right here that every prayer is not pure. When you pray, do you ever think about your motive? Do you ever think about why am I coming before a mighty and a holy God? What is the purpose of this prayer? And I'm not saying don't pray. What I'm saying is, is come before God with a pure motive and what it is that you're asking God for. What is it that you're coming before God to do? Every prayer is not pure. You see, in this particular prayer, Joshua is blaming God, isn't he? Can you hear it? Why did you do this to us? I wonder how often we, in our own sense and in some way, we blame God for something that's happening to us. Why? And and there's nothing wrong with asking God why. I think God wants us to ask why. I think he wants us to question him, but we have to be ready and we have to be willing to listen to the answer and hear the answer that God is giving us. It may not be the answer that you want to hear. Every prayer is not pure, and Joshua blames God. What happened to be strong and courageous, Joshua? What happened to I will be with you wherever you go? Like when Joshua and Caleb went into the land to spy out Canaan. And they came back, and and there were 12 spies that went in, and 10 came back and said, ain't no way, no how, we're going to do this. And Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, but God can. We can do this with the power of God. What happened to that Joshua? He's on his face, kind of sniveling before God. Why did you do this to us? Now everybody around us is going to know that that we're not who they thought they were. Everybody around us is is not going to be afraid of us anymore. What happened to... I will never leave you nor forsake you, Joshua. And then in chapter 7, verses 10 through through 13, God answers Joshua. And I love this to pieces because it just reminds me of me. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. What are you doing down in your face? Does this not sound like a parent with a little kid who's saying, what are you doing down there? Get up. What is your problem? I can relate to that. I remember my dad telling me some of those things. I remember talking to my kids that way. I see my kids talking to my grandkids that way. And 
my wife and I kind of stand off to the side. Mm -hmm. What goes around comes around. Get up. What are you doing down in your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves to prepare in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. And I say it, and we've said it all along in this series, that God cannot and will not tolerate sin. And just as, as the Israelites and God, there, there was a wall there that was separation between God and the children of Israel. When there's sin in our lives, so it separates us from God, and it separates us from knowing the will of God and from experiencing the the life that he created us to live. Get up, he told Joshua. See, there's a time to pray and there's a time to move. And God often tells us when we pray, he says, get going, I've got a job for you to do, or get going, here's what you need to do in response to your prayer. But the key to this is you've got to listen. It's not just a, a one-way conversation where we're, where we're disgorging our, our problems and our our anxieties and our cares to God, but there's a second part of that where we listen to what God has to say for us. And there's a time to pray and there's a time to move. There's a time to action. You see, action without prayer is atheism. Now, before you throw rocks at me and tell me I am not an atheist, listen to the definition of what atheism is. If I can find it here in my notes. You can probably read it for yourself. Action without prayer is atheism. Atheism is the disbelief of God's. Is, atheism is not a disbelief of God's. I'll read it this way. Better eyes. Atheism is not a disbelief in God's or a denial of God's. It is a lack of belief in God's. And when we go off on our own and when we do our own thing and we do, when we do not consider what God wants for us, isn't that kind of what we're doing it's kind of a disbelief in God because we don't it's like we don't trust him it's like we don't want to hear maybe what he has to say we want to do our own thing you see the purpose of prayer is not to inform God the purpose of prayer is to invite God to rule your life you see prayer without action is presumption Action without prayer is atheism. Do we think that we know the mind of God? Do we think that we know what's best for ourselves? See, there's a time to fall on our face, but then there's a time to stand up and get moving when God tells us to move. Action without prayer is athe atheism, a disbelief, if you will, a lack of faith in what God can do for you and a lack of faith and belief in what we believe that God can and will do in us and for us prayer without action is presumption do we presume that we can pray and not obey god do we presume that we can put our requests before god and then when he answers them and says this is what i want you to do either we don't hear that or we ignore it or we just completely flat out disobey it no that can't be right god you can't be asking me to do that that's way outside my comfort zone oh really I don't think Joshua ever asked for this position as a leader of Israel, and that that's the position that God put him in. Maybe God's got something in store for you that is so far outside the box, it's not even a, a blip on your radar at this point. And yet then all of a sudden, God puts a seed in your heart, and he said, this is what I want you to do. And at that point, it's time to get up and get moving. And maybe you're here this morning, you say, well, I've, I've never heard God speak into my heart like that. I've never heard God say anything. Are you listening? Do you take the time to just be still before God and say, God, what do you want to tell me? What do you want to teach me? You see, in all the, all the hubbub and all the confusion and all the noise and the distractions that are going on in our world, it's so easy to miss the voice of God and all that because the Bible says that God speaks to us in a still, small voice. Sometimes he whacks us up the side of the head like he did Joshua. But sometimes he speaks softly. And if we're not listening, it goes right over our heads, in one ear, out the other or not even in the air. 
Prayer without action is presumption. Either way, it's destined for failure by missing out on, the, on God's perfect plan for you at the very least. And maybe destined for failure by going down a road that you never intended to, get, to go down. Maybe making a decision on your own that God never intended you to make. And then there's consequences. Or, as I said, at the very least, we miss out on the blessing of the, of the abundant life that God promised to give us. See, the purpose of prayer is not to inform God. You know, it's not kind of like telling God something. Do, do we think that we can tell something, tell God something that he doesn't already know? God, this is going on in my life. He knows that. We can't tell God anything that he doesn't already, got, already know. The purpose of prayer is not to inform God. The purpose of prayer is to invite God to rule your life to take control 100%, good times, bad times, and then report for duty. Time to move, time to act. Invite God to rule your life and then listen to what he has to say. Because God always gives his, his best to those who leave the choice to him. In our men's group, and this is kind of a little advertisement, we heard last week from a, a guy, I mean, this guy was like a man's man. He was like, I don't, he was huge, and he was buff, and he was lifting the iron, but he was an ex-Navy SEAL. Probably the most rigorous training of any of the armed forces, arguably. I know maybe some of you might argue or take that point, but needless to say, one of the toughest. His favorite thing to do is to jump out of, an, of a plane at 35,000 feet and parachute. And he made the comment that, when you get down to 5,000 feet and your chute hasn't opened, you better be praying because you're getting pretty close to the ground. And when he, thought, when he said that, I thought to myself, I wonder how many of us shoot up parachute prayers where we don't even seek God. We don't even, we don't even ask God. We don't even talk to him until it's like panic mode. We're at 5,000 feet and that parachute's not opening. How many of us shoot up parachute prayers and then sit back and expect God to do something miraculous to bail us out. Where, if we had been praying all the time, then maybe we had never gotten that. Parachute would have opened at 34,000 feet instead of crying out for it to open up at 5,000 feet. You see, if you pray in times of victory, if you continue in prayer when things are going good, if you just pray and you just have that, establish that relationship with God, where you're, where you're talking to him, not telling him things that he already knows, but asking him, the, the Bible says, bring your petitions before the Lord and, and he will answer you. If we pray in the good times and we establish that relationship, then when the bad times come, we've already established that mode of life, a life in Christ, a life living to what God has to say to us. So when the crises come and trouble comes and it will come, Jesus himself said, you will experience trouble in this life. It's an imperfect world. It's a broken world that we live in, and we are a broken people. But when we have that relationship with him, and we've already established it, and, and we're, we're living within the will of his life in the good times, then when the bad time comes, we won't have to plead in times of defeat. If you pray in times of victory, you won't have to plead in times of defeat because God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. Well, we know the results of Achan's sin. His family was stoned. The whole family. And whether you think that's pretty harsh of God, it was pretty harsh of God. But we are God's to do with as he pleases. And he knew that if he did not weed out sin from the hearts of the Israelites at that moment in time, that it would spread like a bad apple in a barrel. And they were all buried in the, in the valley of, a of Achor. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like Achan? And it is basically the same. Achan translated means trouble. A person, Achor, is the valley. It's a place of trouble. And it still is called the valley of Achor to this day. Well, once Joshua and the Israelites weeded out the problem of sin, they went up and they defeated it. God gave them a plan. They adhered to the plan. And, they, and the city of Ai was defeated by the Israelites. 
all part of God's perfect plan. If Achan had just waited, if he had just listened to what God was telling him, if he had listened to the instructions of his commander and not taken anything, he would have been far richer than he was if he had just, than what he took at the time when he took to help himself to what he wasn't supposed to. See, God told the Israelites, this time you can keep the spoils of victory. This time you can keep the goodies from the city of Ai. And they did just that. And so if we learn anything from this message this morning, it's this, pray often and always. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, a verse that most of you probably know very well. And if you don't, it's a good one to learn. It just says this, pray continually. Period. Pray continually. What does that mean, pray continually? It means pray often. It means pray always. Now, I know when you're you're working and when you're at your occupation or when you're going to school or when you're at home with the kids and when you're dealing with issues, it's, I get it. Your mind is going 100 miles an hour. But when you have a moment, just conversation with God. You don't have to have a flowery speech and flowery things to say. And God doesn't like the these and nows and King James version of prayer. No, it's just you talking to, to God. Just you. Just your heart. Just your mind. God wants to hear from you. He's there with his arms open wide, waiting for you to come to him. Pray often and always. Whatever, whenever, wherever. Pray early in the process and then report for duty. What is it that you want me to do, Lord? After we, we give him all of our petitions, we give him all of our praise, and then we listen. Now what? What is it that you want me to do, God? With God's mercy, forgiveness, and redemption, the Valley of Achor the valley of trouble, will someday be restored. And it's a sign to us that someday restoration will happen. And there is restoration and redemption available to every one of us right now. Josh, you have that map up there real quick? I just want to show you something real quick. So on your left, the map, you can see where that little red symbol is up there. That's the valley of Achor, right next to the city of Jericho. And on the other side is what it looks like today. That is still the Valley of Achor, dry, barren. And it looks like a valley of trouble, does it not? Two verses in the Old Testament that refer to this. In Isaiah, who was a prophet in the Old Testament, well after all this is going on with Joshua and the Israelites, and Isaiah wrote during a a particular time of trouble in the Israelite nation as well, and he wrote this, Sharon will become a pasture for flocks and the valley of Acre, a resting place for herds for my people who seek me. What he's saying there is that someday this will be restored to its original beauty. Right now, it's just a desolate wilderness. But someday in the future, when Jesus comes back, when, when the land is restored and, and he creates a new, a new world, a new earth, this is all going to be restored to a place of beauty. And then the same thing in Hosea, another prophet, in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, and Hosea again wrote during a time when the Israelites were going through tremendous trouble, again, which they did continually. But he said, there I will give her back her vineyards. This is God talking about Israel. He says, I will give her back her vineyards and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt. You see, the principle is God saying, I can take your trouble and turn it into triumph. I can take your defeat and make it a delight. I can make the door of failure, the door of discouragement, the door of heaviness, the door of defeat. I can close that for you, and I can open the door of hope. See, don't let your past define your future. Don't be defined by failures of the past. Don't be defined by the things, the mistakes maybe that you've made in the past. Take it to God and let him define your future for you. See, the victorious Christian life is full of new beginnings. It's a lifetime of them. Every day is a new opportunity for you to become the person that Christ created you to be. Every day, it's a new opportunity. Every day is a new day in the promises of God. You see, God never made a promise that was too good to be true. You've heard promises that were too good to be true. We've all heard them. God didn't. 
hundreds and hundreds of promises in the Bible. God has never failed one of them. Every one of God's promises is true, and he has never made a promise for you that was too good to be true. Psalm chapter 37, and we'll close, this, close with this, verses 23 and 24 says, As the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him, though he stumbles, though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Any of you ever stumbled in a figurative way of speaking? Stumbled in your walk with the Lord? Stumbled in your walk? Made mistakes in the past? Don't let that define your future. Let God define your future for you. And I don't know your, where you're at this morning in your walk with the Lord, but it's never too late to become the person that God created you to be. Let today be the start of God defining your future for you. If you need prayer, if you'd like me to pray for you or any of our prayer team will be up here after the service. If you have never asked Christ into your heart and into your life, don't leave here this morning without doing that. It's a decision of a lifetime and it'll be the start of a new life for you. I just encourage you to do that. So would you pray with me this morning? Father God, thank you for your word. We thank you for the Israelites and, and your chosen people. We thank you for Joshua and his example and we thank you even for his failures that we can look into and we can, we can see how you brought him through out of that and the lessons that we can learn from that. Father God, this morning I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear you and then give us the courage to act, to move, to do what you're asking us to do because we know and we claim your promise that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us, that you're always there, right there beside us no matter what. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, I really encourage you to come back next week. Special treat, Jim Jessup from Jessup University is going to be speaking for you. It's, he's been here before. It's always a treat. He's an awesome speaker. You don't want to miss it. So come on back next week. Enjoy the heat this week. Stick around. We have a cake to celebrate the kids' promotion. Enjoy the fellowship. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. <laughs>